St. Kentigern Cemetery as we mark the final resting place of Patrick Gallagher, Celtic's first ever jersey player, buried just yards away from his teammate Tom Maley, just up there. We welcome today's speakers, two of which Celtic legends who know a bit about playing for the jersey themselves. First of all, Lisbon Lyon and Celtic Grave Society patron Jim Craig. Let's give Jim a particularly warm welcome to the 50th anniversary of Lisbon Lumen. Our second speaker is another man who needs no introduction. The captain of the team who stopped the 10, Tom Boyd, another Jersey player who is always at home with Celtic support. After Paddy Gallagher died in 1899, his widow and daughter emigrated to Boston, America, and so we were unable to have any family here today. However, the Boston Celtic Supporters Club have sent their best wishes to Frank Hanneme and the Celtic Graves to read this out on their behalf. We're particularly honoured today to have Charlie Tully Jr. over from Belfast to say a few words. to represent the Belfast Celtic Society. Charlie Tully is of course one of the greatest ever players to wear the Celtic jersey and the Belfast Celtic jersey. The Belfast Celtic Society, great friends of Celtic Grave Society, we admire the fantastic work they do in keeping the name of Belfast Celtic alive and they are a group who have always inspired us. We then ask Father Tom White from St Mary's in the Calton, the birthplace of Celtic FC, to conduct the blessing of the grave. We then take the chance to lay some flowers in the grave and I'll close the cemetery with some words of thanks if we can get some pictures taken. We're also very honoured to have with us today Charlie Gallagher. Charlie is of course the man who kick-started the Jockstein revolution. Jock gets all the credit, but if it wasn't for Charlie's corner, the lead to Billy McNeil's header in the 1965 Scottish Cup final, where would we be? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, never forget Charlie Gallagher. Ladies and gentlemen, the story of Paddy Gallagher is the story of Celtic's first decade, as he was present at every single Celtic event. And remarkably, he was also there before our foundation at one of the most significant events that led to the birth of Celtic. Everyone knows the story of the successful Hibs team being fetid in St Mary's Hall after the Scottish Cup triumph in February 1887. But the match that made up Brother Walker's mind that he should set up his own team in Glasgow with charitable aims it was in 26th of May 1887 when he invited Hibs and Renton to play for the East End Charity Cup with the money raised going to the poor children's dinner tables. Paddy Gallagher was in the Hibs team having signed a month earlier and Hibs drew one each in front of an incredible crowd of 12,000 which was larger than the Scottish Cup final. Brother Wolf's mind was made up that day and not missing a trick, he invited both teams back to Glasgow's East End on the 6th of August 1887 to play the replay. Paddy again played for Hibs as a lost 6-0. Nine months later, the original Celtic Park was opened on 8th of May, and as Dr John Conway and Joseph Shaughnessy led the teams Hibs and Cowlers out that day, who was there right behind them? Paddy Gallagher was right behind in the green of Hibernian. At the end of the following month too, he had agreed to play for Celtic, along with half the Hibs team. <laughs> the style of play was described as vigorous and forceful, but not unduly so. These qualities were rewarded when he was appointed vice-captain to James Kelly. He was a player loved by the Celtic support and reviled by everyone else. You could replace the name there of Paddy Gallagher for numerous other Celtic players. On his return to Hibernian Park for the first time when Celtic visited, the home crowd weren't too chuffed at seeing him in his new Celtic colours, 
along with half of his former players. He's so eager for the, to shake uh, Paddy's hand, or maybe his neck, that the Hibs support invaded the pitch three times, with Paddy Gallagher the centre of attention each time. But Paddy was unfazed when he stood his ground. That's the first name of my father, he was nice, described as having admirable personal qualities of which grit, pluck and determination were prominent. Another described him as a daring halfback, an indefatigable worker with an abundance of resources and a speed which few halfbacks could equal. Another described him as fiery a little of temper in his early career. Time toned this down and enabled him to play to a most genial wit. That made him the most pleasant of companions, the most lovable of jolly good fellows. Paddy Gallagher is immortalised in the only surviving team picture in the original white top with the green cross, which was taken at Vale of Leavens Ground on the 22nd of December 1888. He'd already, we had already been playing in the green and white stripes for six weeks before this picture and we only wore the strip that day for the picture and then changed back into the stripes at half time. Celtic's achievements in our first five years for Paddy's achievements before he retired, aged only 28, described as an old war horse. In his first two seasons he won the North Eastern Cup, in his third season he won the Glasgow Cup. In his fourth season he was recommended in the AGM to become Celtic captain, but he couldn't get in the team. So he became part of the historic Celtic team that season who won the Scottish Cup for the first time. He became the first we became, we became the first club to win the treble of the Glasgow Cup, the Scottish Cup and the Charity Cup. In the following season he was part of the Celtic team who won the league for the first time. His list of achievements are long. He played in a record 6-1 victory over Rangers at Ibrox in 1889, which was never broken. He played in Celtic's first ever league match in 1890. He scored his one and only goal for Celtic away to Sheffield Wednesday in 1891. He took part in the first two Celtic sports in 1890 and 1891. He played in the first ever match at the original Celtic Park. And he played in the last ever match at the same ground, back where we started with a win over Rangers. He also played in the first ever match at the current Celtic Park in August 1892. If I happened to Celtic, it happened to Paddy Gallagher. After retiring, Paddy was still happy to assist in any way, and he became a Celtic umpire back in the days when each team would put up a man to run the line. At the 1893 AGM, <coughs> Paddy's popularity was obvious when he was voted onto the Celtic Committee and re-elected each year until 1897 when the club became a limited liability company and a board of directors replaced the Celtic Committee. Sadly, Paddy died aged only 33, but his legacy and his massive Celtic heart lives on. For 117 years, his grave has lain unmarked, but today we've righted that wrong and we can ensure his name lives on forever. Thank you. Lisbon line, Jim 45 games for Celtic, one goal doesn't sound very good, although considering the term record and my record, it's not too bad at all. But there was a reason for it back then. When football first started, they played with one full back, a goalkeeper of course as well, one full back, one half back and eight forwards. And it was very much kick and rush, individual dribbles and just everybody fighting for the ball. And then it Great, it gradually changed, so there was two full-backs, two half-backs, and six forwards, because somebody had worked out that you can't do anything other than a square pass if you've got eight forwards up front, and if you spread them out a wee bit, you could have triangular movements and triangular passes, and that was very much easier for keeping possession of the, the ball every time that uh, Pat Gallagher was playing. It had changed then to a 2-3-5 formation, where the centre-half, was an attacking player, could come forward at will. The two fullbacks came in as sweepers behind him because half the time he wasn't in the centre half position. And the two wing halves, of whom Pat Gallagher was one of them, moved out to cover the wingers. So that's why 
Bagala had only scored one goal in 45 matches. He was never in an attacking position uh, to get uh, a goal. And um, it's no surprise that that was the case. A tough old time back then. I mean, the penalty kick didn't come in until 1891, halfway through his time at Celtic Park. And there were a few incidents that happened that nowadays might raise an eyebrow or two. On the 15th of November 1888, Port Glasgow Athletic came up to Colt Bridge and the game ended 6-2 for Albion Rovers. The Port Glasgow left back walked off in a huff in the second half when the score was only 4-2. But after pressure from his committee members, he agreed to come back. And obviously it didn't help very much anyway because he lost another two goals when he came back. And it just shows you can't trust a left back, can you? I'm glad you're here today, man. And then in season 1890-91, in a match between Albion Rovers and Glasgow Wanderers at Cope Bridge, referee Mr. Smelly caused a great commotion by ordering off the wrong man. Consequently, the game was stopped until both sets of committee men remonstrated with the referee. Justice was finally done and the game was restarted. You can't imagine all those things happening now. now th these are taken from a book called uh, The Boys from the Brig, The History of Albion Rovers Football Club, written by a real fanatic. And because he's a fanatic, he sometimes is too keen to put Albion Rovers up against the top of, amongst the big boys of football. And I'm afraid in season 1966-67, and I'll beg your indulgence to, to, to read this one out, he goes right over the top, by the way, right? In May, Celtic had their moment of glory in Lisbon, defeating Inter Milan 2-1 in the European Cup final. And back home, Rovers were once again champions for the third year in a row at the Glasgow Corporation Sports Five-A-Side Tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Determined to get Celtic and Albion Rovers in the same set. <laughs> it's always great to come to these uh, uh, events because you hear about players who have slid out the public eye. This poor man only lasted 53 years on earth. And they obviously gave his all in the cause for Celtic. It's a shame we don't have any uh, members of the family here uh, today to, uh, to help us honour them. But uh, thank you all for coming along here today and you will now take away with you the name of Patrick Gallagher. Thank you very much. I'm not going to park right there. <laughs> I think there's another one coming. And there's another one coming. I think we better get done, done before the game starts. Ah, he's got a charging one. <laughs> no, he's, he's parked. Oh, thank you very much. Well, first, thanks very much for your, your wonderful introduction earlier. And, and, and like Jim, I can say that uh, you know, Paddy scored about one goal in 45 games. I beat that. I had two in about 400 games. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't because of the, the formations that we played, Jim, but it took way back then. But, uh, I think duty speech has not been my forte, and obviously listening to uh, Brendan and, and Jim, um, and I can assure you I'm very glad that the sun is out today. I've come along to a couple of these uh, occasions, and it's been absolutely boring. It is cold but it's dry, so thankfully, you know, thank the Lord for, for giving us such a, a, a wonderful day. Uh, well, obviously here to commemorate Paddy Gallagher, and uh, there is what fair, Paddy was a guy who did wear his hat and his sleeve, uh, and there have been many others, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Brendan, that uh, have enjoyed that kind of reputation, guys like Johnny Doyle, uh, Neil Lennon, and even my current captain, uh, Scott Brown, to uh, sort of spring to mind. These players, I think, gave everything for the club and gave everything for their jersey. Uh, and uh, in contrast to uh, those kind of players, we have players probably like uh, Jim uh, and myself who were maybe more conservative, uh, more measured uh, in their expressive behaviour uh, on a football field, uh, but no less determined uh, in their approach to the game. You know, guys like uh, Jim and a uh, uh, Lisbon, uh, 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 sorry, a uh, uh, European Cup winner, Davy Hay, who was a quiet assassin, was another one. Uh, and uh, Henry Larson, uh, the sort of best player I played with in my time at Sexton. Um, I would include myself in that camp, but only when it came to dodgy, except when it came to dodgy refereeing decisions, I could lose it a wee bit there. When, and we've had plenty of those down the years, I think, haven't we? We've all been covered today. 
Uh, but the common link within all these uh, successful players is a drive and ambition to win for the football club, a hatred of losing games. Uh, and this has, has has been expressed in so many different ways. In different ways. Uh, Paddy, I believe, had a burning hunger to succeed for their club and expressed his feelings openly, and hence uh, he wore his hat on his sleeve. Uh, unfortunately, and sadly, there have been too many players who have played for a great football club. I think that the Times didn't even have a heart in their chest. And I think we can certainly mention uh, quite a few of those. That one had a bit of uh, wet, they could open these papers. But what I find amazing in, in looking at Paddy's character and, and how he expressed himself for all to see, much like Johnny, Neil and Scott was the man and how they were depicted by external sources such as oppression and opposition supporters. Uh, they were vilified almost and demonised for the heinous crime of giving every ounce of commitment that they could for the football club. Uh, and the strange thing is that most, if not all, of these other teams are players with the very same nature but with a differing, le differing level of context. And uh, spoke about them, they would have been either combative players or lovable rogues. Uh, but when you consider the span uh, of this has went on from Paddy way back to uh, Scott, I suppose nothing has changed in our broken history. Uh, there's a, it reminds me of a, a, a well-known quote, and it, uh, it says uh, that along the lines of, you can wear your heart on your sleeve, but just remember that not everyone will like the colour of your shirt. And I think quite a few of our players have certainly experienced that uh, down the years uh, from uh, the reaction. For, for what they gave to, to this football club. And to finish, I'm truly humbled to be in the presence of so many caring fans. I was along at uh, St Rock celebrating the Melbourne Celtic supporter clubs with uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie uh, and Charlie uh, today and uh, Father John Sweeney and gave a very passionate speech uh, about uh, people uh, all seem to be remembering Brother Walford and what he did for the club and seem to forget uh, those others that uh, were around at that time and who helped in so many different ways of building the football club and starting, uh, you know, playing within that. And I'm so glad that I'm here, uh, you know, with Brendan and the rest of the Celtic Graves Society, right? Um, and uh, just glad that I'm party uh, to be part of the Celtic family that do remember their own, who had such an impact in creating our history. So thank you very much for your your, your great work and uh, hope it continues. Yeah. Please welcome Charlie Tully, Jr. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say it's an absolute honour and privilege for my son Paul and I to be here today, particularly in my role as President of the Belfast Celtic Society. And I want to pay tribute to the wonderful work being done by the Celtic Graves Society and to thank them for their invitation here today. It really is an honour and a privilege to be here among all you Celtic supporters, of which of course Paul and I are very much uh, part of, to be included and to feel part of the Celtic family. Um, referring to Tommy's uh, previous words are regarding the, the event we were at earlier this morning, um, the Melbourne Celtic supporters anniversary. Father Sweeney referred to the fact that uh, Celtic, being part of Celtic and supporting Celtic was more than about football and there's no doubt about that. We can see that today with the tremendous work that's going on and continues to go on. So it's a privilege for us back in Belfast to be connected to so many friends, supporters, helpers in the society and at Celtic Park to be um, among all these wonderful Lisbon Lions, Tommy, Bertie last night and Bertie reminded me, uh, Paul and I are privileged to be uh, invited to the board later today at the park before the game. And when Bertie heard that we were guests on the board, he said to me, what? The board? He says, Christ, he says, wait a minute. He says, forgive me, Paul. He says, <laughs> this was Bertie. He says, he says, you've achieved more than your die. He says, the only time he ever appeared before the board was when he was suspended or fined. <laughs> Which was probably true. <laughs> it reminds me of another story. As you know, my father uh, loved to play at Celtic Park, particularly in front of the jungle, which would have been an experience at any time. But 
he reminded us when we when I was young of a particularly bad game he was having. One of the very few he would say. And he said this particular supporter up towards the corner flag, every time it was a throw in or he's playing up the wing, it was Tully or a pudding, Tully or this, Tully or that, having a really bad time. So as the game progressed into the second half, corner kick, and this guy had been giving it the whole game long. And I think my dad just had enough of it. So corner kick. Referee points him without, lifts the ball, walks over into the jungle, takes the guy out, sets the ball down, says, here, you take it. She wants the better than me. <laughs> Which I can well imagine. Just finally, um, on behalf of the Belfast Celtic Society, I would like to uh, present a cheque, a contribution, on behalf of them to the Celtic Grace Society, for the wonderful work you do, for the tremendous generosity and support we've received from you. Long may it continue, and thank you for all your friendship, and for having us here today, it really is an honour and a privilege. Thanks very much for this, Charlie. It's an honour for the Celtic Grape Society to be associated with the Belfast Celtic Society as well. Please send our best wishes back to Belfast. Now we get Frank Hannaway from the Celtic Graves to read out the Boston Celtic Sports Club statement. The, the, the link that we have with the fans for the work that we do is very, very important to us. Uh, and, you know, the, in particular, the likes of the, your, the guys turning up today. Uh, the lifeblood is that we've got the interest from the fans and we get to share uh, what we've found with you. But in particular, those fans who are so far away and don't necessarily get the opportunity to attend or even attend 10 games, it's great to know that they still have the heart and soul of the club in them. And this is reflected today with a statement from the, the, the Boston Celtic Supporters Club, um, where Patrick's, fa the, Patrick's family, that's, they ended up in Boston, and it's, that, that's been picked up by these guys and the fact that they've sent the best wishes. So the Boston Celtic Supporters Club sent our prayers for Patrick Gallagher. His ancestors ended up in the Boston area, like many of our Celtic Supporters Club members, as, a, as, a, as an example of the Celtic connection worldwide. Patrick and others who have worn the Celtic jersey will have their remembrance and resting space preserved because of the great effort of the Celtic Grave Society. And the Boston Celtic Supporters Club would like to thank the Celtic Grave Society and God bless Patrick Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you, Ash, Father Tom White, who conducted lessons. Please. Another card coming. You think Dave King must have organised these vehicles? <laughs> <laughs> Move them on. Move them down. Move them down. Mm -hmm. Nothing worse than having to rewrite what you're going to say at the last minute, but I need to in this instance. Charlie, five film Mary's and a good actor. <laughs> <laughs> Before the formal prayers, I'm always touched at what people have to offer at these gatherings and echoing a resonance of what Father Sweeney's obviously said this morning and what Tom has is, is, is highlighted is the fact that some folk will never have their image up on the Celtic way, but the Celtic way, as we know, is greater than that. It's about the living stones of the club and Celtic Grave Society I think helps articulate that in a great way as does the work of the Celtic Foundation and indeed our fans who no matter where they go in the world are cause us to be proud. An important part of the Celtic Way is we believe our living stones never die because they rest in the hope of the resurrection. So as we come to get into the real business of why we're here today, is to wish that this man is at peace and that his face lives in true paradise forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Dear friends, we gather today to pray for our brother Patrick, whose body lies here in rest. <laughs> He has passed from death to life in the company with the Lord Jesus, 
who died and rose to new life, and is purified now from his faults. We pray that God may welcome him among the saints in heaven. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. John the Baptist, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Peter, pray for St. Paul, pray for us. St. Andrew, St. Steve, St. Anne, St. Peter, St. Catherine. All holy men and women, after he comes in Lord, hear our prayer. Christ, pardon his sin. Lord, hear our prayer. Remember the good that he did. Lord, hear our prayer. Christ, receive him into eternal life. Lord, hear our prayer. Christ, comfort all those who mourn. Lord, hear our prayer. And remember, Patrick, and then this month in November, we remember all their death, especially those associated with Please bear the pay now to the patron of the birthplace of Celtic, Our Lady, St. Mary. Hail Mary. Glory to the Lord is with thee. Blessed is that thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, forgive us our sins. Almighty and eternal God, bless and renew your abundant grace upon this grave. As here lies our brother Patrick, send your holy angel to guard over it, and on the day of the resurrection, lead him and those dear to you safely home to paradise. So we make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. rest, grant unto him the Lord, and let perpetual life shine upon him. May he rest in peace. May his soul, the soul of all the earth, through mercy of God. O God, by whose mercy the faithful departed find rest, bless this gravestone which we mark the resting place of Patrick. May he have everlasting life, and rejoice in you with your saints forever. We ask this through Christ our Lord. I can just now impart a blessing upon you before you relay the tributes. Now this blessing is intended for you, for those dear to you, especially anyone who is ill. The Lord be with you. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit come down upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. In closing, I'd just like to thank everyone who has attended today and made this event special. I'd like to thank Danny Rooney, a great friend of the Celtic Grave Society, providing this lovely marker. I'd like to thank as well Celtic Chief Executive of the Celtic Foundation, Tony Hamilton. I was just about to crack a joke there about Fergus McCann wants his hat back, but you took the hat off, so that talks to his flat. Put the hat back on for the joke. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to remind everyone that there will be a special uh, anniversary mass in honour of Brother Walford tomorrow at St Mary's, Calton, 3pm. If anyone would like a brochure, today's event, please see our glamorous sellers, Paul, thank you. Thank you.
Well, the Walters' plan was set in 1888. The club was born to beat the poor, and Celtic was his name. And that was Brother Walford's dream. God had given him the strength to fight for good and rights. And he has given us the team to blaze in green and whites. From Irish shores to Scottish hearts and all that's in between. And that was Brother Walford's dream. Looking down on us and smiles on what he sees In this place called paradise united in belief Through the wind and through the rain and throughout history We won't forget our brother's dream Street.